Hello, I am Slim Monster the Witch, and in this series I like to talk about celebrities and how they were murdered. Today's case is quite a doozy, so without further ado, we should get into it. But before we do roll the credits, I do want to let you know, guys know I am down on uh, Twitch right now. I don't know why my OBS does not want to connect to the Twitch. Um, so I digress. I'm going to just go ahead and record it and then just throw it up on YouTube and Facebook. And I will give you the plugs there for you at the end of the show, just in case you guys want to know that. Um, but yeah, as I said, this case is quite a doozy. I'm going to go ahead and roll um, the intro. Oh, maybe one day. There we go. All right. So the dude we are talking today, this doozy case we are going to be talking to about, to, whatever. Anyways, it's Bob Crane. He was uh, most popular from the CBS situational comedy Hogan's Heroes. After the show, he would have a hard time finding work on television until his unfortunate demise, which was both messy and has remained unsolved. It's truly a tale of dark scenery in the Hollywood business and a sexual deviant who couldn't control himself. Um, Robert Edward Crane is the guy we're talking about today. He was born on July 13th of 1928 in Waterbury, Connecticut. His parents were named Alfred Thomas Crane and Rosemary Kish Crane. Crane being, um, Crane began to play drums at a very young age. Um, at the age of 11 and in a junior high school, he would organize local drum and bugle parades in his neighborhood friends, which sounds super lame, but you know, it was the 20s and the depression and stuff so um joined his high school orchestra in marching bands he would graduate from the high school in 1946 then he enlisted for two years in 1948 um getting out of the national guard in 1950 now in 1949 kind of in between when he was working uh, in the enlistment he married his high school sweetheart and turzen and now his um, his now wife and Bob had three children together, Robert David, seen at the top, Deborah Ann, who is, I'm assuming, in the blue, and Karen Leslie, who is, I'm assuming, in the, the red. In 1950, Crane began to evolve his career into radio, started in New York, moved around the East Coast, a little bit into the South. He eventually hit... Um, California, and he was hired by CBS uh, Radio as a morning show host. The California Morning Show was a hit, and it brought on special guests like Marilyn Monroe, Frank Sinatra, Bob Hope, yada yada. His succession in radio led him to get um, – sorry, that's a little easy. My bad. Okay, here we go. I'm back. Uh, so his success in radio led him to host the Johnny Carson daytime show, Who Do You Trust? Made appearance on Twilight Zone, Channing, um, the Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and the Dick Van, the Dick Van Dyke Show. I don't, you don't need to edit me for that, all right? I swear. Oh, there I did it again. There he is playing drums on the Dick Van Dyke Show. In 1963, he was brought on as a regular character to the Donna Reed Show, and he was only on that show for about a year. Um, and then after that, he was um, about 1965. The Hogan's Heroes would cast Bob Cranes as a star role in the sitcom set in a World War II por prisoner of war camp, which is that's wild. That's like I've never actually seen Hogan's Heroes. I always heard about it. I didn't really realize it was set in a World War II prison camp, and they're like the they're like harassed by German people all day long. What a we that's wild. What a weird show that's a situational comedy for sure anyways the show was a hit too and it lasted until about 1971 um during hogan's heroes crane did end up having an affair and eventually left his wife in 1970 after 21 years of marriage he did a couple more movies um before he kind of lost his role one of them being um super dad um with a very young young ass kurt russell there he is to the right looking at that girl so young and then he did guess in 1976 with don Knotts. it's about a horse or something like that um but there is when basically the decline started happening he started to really get you know popularity started to become loose and that was because of what was happening in his private life and now that we do know a little bit about Bob Crane and his his career life, let's go ahead and explore that private life and his eventual death. And it's kind of dark and seedy. So Crane frequently 
Um, well, I'm going to bring it up to you a little bit more. When um, Bob was on the set of Hogan's Heroes, he named a fella, he met a fellow by the name of John Henry Carpenter. This is John Henry Carpenter right there, um, but we'll get that to that later. All right, so he made a dude named by the, John of, uh, by the name of John Henry Carpenter, the regional sales manager for Sony Electronics. The two fellas became great friends, started hitting the bars together, and it, the, it would be that, that would be it from there. Um, so with him being met, uh, meeting John Carpenter and them going to the bars together, they ended up doing this really dark CD thing of frequently videotaping and photographing their sexual escapades, um, which is cry- kind of crazy to think about because the cameras back then in like 1969 looked like this. Like that's massive. That is massive. There's no way in hell you can go, you know, you can go to pound town and get all those camera angles with that thing on your, so- your shoulder. It's just not going to happen. Not going to happen. Anyways, so well, that's what they did. And um, um, some women did give consent. However, there were rumors that women did not give consent. And that is crazy because have you not noticed that thing? But I digress. <clears throat> Um, this kept on for a while. They continued to do this with many women. They would go to the bars, they would, um, get women and they would actually, um, end up joining their schedules together so they could, uh, meet, um, eventually, uh, Carpenter went to another company and, um, Crane got, uh, the play that was touring over certain parts of, I think from Florida to like Arizona to like California. So they would like set up meetings to go do this. Well, in 1978, Crane lived with uh, the Win- Winfield Place Apartments in Scottsdale, Arizona during the run of Beggar's Luck at Windmill Dinner Theater. On afternoon of June 29th, his co-star Victoria Ann um, Betty, or Barry entered his apartment and failed to show up for a lunch meeting. He discovered the body of Crane bludgeoned with a weapon that was never identified. Though investigators believe it to be the camera tripod, an electrical cord had been tied around his neck. Crane's funeral was held on July 5th, 1978 at Paul the Apostle Catholic in Westwood, Los Angeles. <clears throat> now, the Scottsdale Police Department had no homicide division at this time, so it was well equipped to handle such a high-profile murder investigation. The crime scene yielded few, cu- few clues, no evidence was found of forced entry, and <clears throat> nothing of value was missing. Detectives examined Crane's extensive videotape collection, which led them to Carpenter. There's Carpenter again. Um, which had flown to Phoenix on June 25th to spend a few days with Crane. Carpenter's rental car was impounded and searched um, with several types of blood smears found around. One of them matched the blood type of Crane. However, there was no DNA evidence at that time, so they kind of just declined to file charges, and it was just kind of left up in the air. Well, 1990, so this is like 12 years after after that, Scottsdale Police Detective Barry Vassal and Mark Cupio, Mark Copa County, uh, yeah, Marco, Mary Copa, I don't know how to pronounce that. County Attorney's Office investigated Jim Raines. Investigator Jim Raines re examined the evidence from the 1978, persuaded the uh, county attorney to reopen the case. DNA testing was inclusive on the blood found in Carpenter's re- rental, so John Carpenter's rental car, but Raines did not discover any evidence. Photographs of the car's interiors to show a piece of brain tissue, which was said to be the case. Um, The Arizona judge ruled that new evidence was admissible in 1992. Carpenter was arrested and uh, charged with Crane's murder. All right. Now, at the 1994 trial, Crane's son, Robert, testified that in the weeks before his father's death, Crane had repeatedly expressed his desire to sever his friendship with Carpenter. He said Carpenter had become a hanger honor and that's quotes, and a, quote, nuisance to the point of being obnoxious. My dad expressed that he just did not, didn't need Carpenter kind of hanging around him anymore. He said um, that would be Robert Crane, who testified that Crane had called Carpenter that night before the murder and ended their, their friendship. Um, Carpenter's attorney, which is, I think, that girl in the white jacket right there, attacked the prosecution's case as circumstantial and inconclusive. Um, they presented evidence that Carpenter and Crane were still best friends, including witnesses from the restaurant where the two men had died the evening before the murder. They noted that the murder weapon had never been identified nor found. The prosecution's camera tripod theory was sheer speculation. They said based on Carpenter's occupation, they disputed the claims. The newly discovered evidence photo showed brain tissue and presented many examples of sloppy work by police such as the mishandling and misplacing of evidence, including the crucial tissue samples itself. 
They pointed out the crane had video, been videotaped by photographed in sexual relations with numerous women, implying that any one of them might have been the killers. The potential suspect proposed defense attorneys included angry husbands, boyfriends, and women... Uh, and boyfriends of the women, and even an actor who had sworn vengeance after a violent arguing, argument with Crane that happened in Texas several months earlier. Now, Crane Carpenter was acquitted for the death, but he continued to remain his innocence after his death in 1998, so four years after 1994, his trial. Um, after the trial, Robert Crane, Bob's son, once again, speculated publicly that Olson, his father's widow, I guess he got married, I I didn't see anything in my report, but apparently he got remarried. And, um, in my, anyways, uh, he, that the, she might have a role in the crime. Nobody got a dime out of the murder. He said, except one person alluding that Crane's will was excluded him, his siblings and his mother and his entire state left to Olson, the widow, um, which is kind of odd. Um, in 2015, the book, uh, Crane, Sex, Celebrity, and My Father's Unsolved Murder, by Robert Crane. He repeated his suspicions. Marcupio County District Attorney Rick Romley responded, we have never characterized Patty as a suspect, adding, I am convinced John Carpenter's murdered Bob Crane. Officially, Crane's murder remains unsolved. Um, in 2016, the Marcupio County Attorney's Office permitted uh, Phoenix Television reporter John Hook to submit a 1978 blood sample um, from Carpenter's rental car for retesting using the more advanced DNA technique that were that was once used in 1990. The two sequences um, were identified, one from an unknown male and the other two degraded to reach a conclusion. So the test consumed all remaining DNA from a rental car, making further tests impossible. Um, authorities tried to get a DNA sample out of the crane and Carpenter's remains, but their families refused permission to exhume them. Um, so crane's life and murder are the subjects of a 2002 film. So if you want to learn more about it, you can watch this movie. It's kind of a, um, a Hollywood section of it, but it's uh, directed. It's called Autofocus, directed by Paul Schrader and starring Greg Kinnear as Bob Crane and William Defoe as John Carpenter. Now, um, this case is super weird, super odd, super unsolved. So, you know, who killed Bob Crane? Was it his actions, his sexual deviant escapades that ended up being getting him bludgeoned to death? Truly sad and dark story. I can only imagine the scenes of his life and his eventual decrease in a population or popularity, which eventually led to him finding seedier ways to get what he wanted. Everything started so well for the dude, too. But prime example of dark side of entertain entertainment history. Well, I am Colton Cass, the witch, a.k.a. Um, Colton Cast, tune in to my shows every Tuesday. I am sorry I didn't get it up on Twitch today. Um, I was going to try to stream on Twitch today too, but that looks like it's not going to happen. Um, but you guys can catch me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Colt period of period the period of Colt. Facebook is at Colton Cast Makes Art. And then you can find me on YouTube uh, and Twitch at Slim Monster the Witch. All right. Um, Bye. Oh, wait, wait. Um, tune in next week because this is going to be the last of the series. I don't know who I'm doing it yet, um, but it'll be the last of the series that I'm doing um, before I move on to divination and some other stuff, fun stuff. So, all right. Thank you. Bye.